welcome back to my channel and if you haven't been here before my name is Ava and I'm a PhD student from UCL. So today I thought I'd talk a bit about hoarding, firstly the symptoms and how they may be related to other disorders like OCD and uh, autism spectrum disorder and then to go into some of the treatment options and looking specifically more at cognitive behaviour therapy but firstly generally overall what kind of treatments are suggested to be used for individuals who have hoarding symptoms. So firstly, what is hoarding disorder? So it's a new concept derived from DSM-5 about seven years ago, and it's categorized in the category of obsessive compulsive related disorders. A recent population study found that the overall prevalence of hoarding disorder is 2%, and transcultural research has found that within Eastern and Western cultures, they present similar symptoms across different areas, such as from the United Kingdom, Japan, Spain, and Brazil. So far, hoarding symptom is seen as a subtype of obsessive compulsive disorder or a partial symptom of obsessive compulsive personality disorder. It's defined as excessive acquisition, regardless of the actual value, difficulty in discarding possessions and disorganization of these things. Due to continuous hoarding, the possessions overflow the living space, therefore hindering living function. Extreme forms of this behaviour can fill the living space and might also cause injuries due to fire or collapse of items that have been hoarded. Therefore, this could not only have an impact on the individuals, but also their friends, families or neighbours. So now let's look at OCD and hoarding. So from this figure, Hollander and Wong hypothesised a model focusing on the compulsivity and impulsivity proposing the concept that OCD, or Obsessive Compulsive Spectrum Disorder, which includes OCD-like compulsive behaviours like eating disorders, pathological gambling and tick or Tourette's disorders, is based on this model that the DSM-5 working group discussed how to organise traditional anxiety disorders and finally OCD became independent of the anxiety disorder group and becoming a core disorder of the OCRD group which includes some of the disorders and a newly presented hoarding disorder. So now let's look at this table that demonstrates the actual symptoms specifically of hoarding disorder. So based on the DSM-5 categorization, there is clear diagnostic criteria making it easier to diagnose this compared to other types of disorders like OCD. So from criterion A, a patient is described as showing persistent difficulty in parting with possessions regardless of their actual value. And though patients may often hoard newspapers, magazines, old clothes, bags, mail and documents, any material can be hoarded. The main reason why they can't discard them are that those items are recognised as useful or beautiful or that they are strongly attached to them. Intense emotional attachment of subjects to objects is an essential feature of hoarding disorder. Hoarding behaviour is therefore quite different from the compulsive behaviour of OCD, which aims to reduce anxiety or distress. As well as OCD perhaps being a comorbid disorder for individuals with hoarding disorder, other disorders have also been suggested, such as autism spectrum disorder and ADHD, attention hyperactive deficit disorder. So in this flow chart of the differential diagnosis of hoarding disorder seen in this figure, you can see that patients with hoarding disorder show early onset and a chronic cause. Typically, this starts in the early teenage years, causing impairment of daily function in the mid-20s and then more severe impairment in the 30s. While clinical cause of HD is very chronic, patients rarely do show spontaneous remission, and therefore living alone, absence of a partner and living space are considered factors that will affect the course of chronicity. So why is it suggested that neurodevelopmental disorders may have a link with hoarding disorder? One study found that 20% of individuals that had hoarding rituals met the criteria for ADHD. Another study found the ADHD was more predictive of hoarding behaviour than OCD. Neurocognitive studies have also shown lower neurocognitive function in patients with hoarding disorder, especially in relation to attention. And looking at several studies looking at individuals who are autistic, they found high frequencies of hoarding behaviour. Recently, one study found that individuals with Asperger's also showed higher counts of hoarding behaviour compared to typically developing control group. Therefore, this suggests that individuals with autism and hoarding behaviour do share some clinical features. Although another study compared individuals with hoarding behaviours with psychiatric controls rather than a control group, 
finding no clinical feature relationship. Therefore, more research really needs to be done to see why this relationship might be there and how strong this relationship might be. So now let's go on to general treatment before looking more specifically at cognitive behaviour therapy and going into depth on the mechanism behind that. At the moment, treatments for hoarding disorder have poor treatment response and that might be because it is seen as a newly made diagnosis and therefore more research and funding needs to be done to see how we can make treatments currently available more effective and tailored to these individuals. Also, presence of comorbid symptoms such as individuals with OCD have shown to lower the treatment response when given cognitive behaviour therapy to those people who also have hoarding rituals. Other predictors of poor treatment response may be due to a very strong attachment to their possessions, poor insight or comorbid depression and anxiety, cognitive impairment and biological abnormality in the ventral prefrontal cortex region of the brain. However, one study looked at individuals with hoarding disorder and those with OCD and found that both had a good treatment response when treated with paroxetine. At the moment, it is expected that individuals with hoarding disorder are given treatment through trial and error to see what is the most effective for them. At present, CBT treatment has been seen to have some effect, which is why I'm going to specialise more into that in a minute. Some CBT have focused on motivation, skill training and decision making. Concerning medication, SSRIs or antidepressants have been suggested to be used as they are often widely used in anxiety and depressive disorders. The effects of other drugs like NMDA modulators or atypical neuroleptics are still unknown and therefore SSRIs may be more likely to be suggested. So now let's look a bit into CBT and how this could be used to treat hoarding disorder. So current CBT for hoarding reduces symptoms by approximately 25%. However, it helps less than a third of individuals who go through the whole treatment. One paper suggested a harm reduction approach to increase effectiveness among a wider variety of people who need this treatment. Also, it may need to target interpersonal issues as well as emotional dysregulation rather than just exposure therapy. So now let's go into what it actually does so that this can make a bit more sense. The first cognitive behaviour model for hoarding was created by Frost and Hartle and this was later updated by Steckerty and Frost. In this model, problems with information processing, maladaptive beliefs, and excessive attachment to possessions are thought to contribute to the behaviour avoidance issues. Experimental evidence has shown that individuals with hoarding disorder have shown longer periods of time taken to discard possessions, experience more anxiety and acquire and save more items. This therefore drives excessive acquiring and saving behaviours. So firstly, in relation to information processing, individuals with hoarding disorder may find it difficult to categorise possessions. And this would contribute to the clutter or disorganisation of all of the items they have. Therefore experiencing more anxiety when they continuously try to sort through their items. This deficit is unknown whether it's due to specifically having an under-inclusive categorization style, so less items are included in each category, so more categories are created because more items are perceived as unique, suggested by CBT model, or some other organisational deficit. Secondly, maladaptive beliefs. So this would be having stronger beliefs that they need to keep these items in in order to retain memories. For example, thinking my memory is so bad that I cannot let this item leave my sight, otherwise I will forget. Or a belief of having responsibility for the possession, so thinking it's my responsibility to find an important meaning behind this item, as well as an exaggerated need to maintain control over possessions, so thinking that it's just yours and no one else should see it or touch. And also an excessive need to use these possessions for emotional comfort. Therefore, more intense endorsement into these beliefs leads to more severe hoarding symptoms. However, endorsement of these beliefs seems to differ cross-culturally. For example, one study found that a Chinese non-clinical sample found that only beliefs of the responsibility that they had to their possessions enhanced hoarding symptoms. Whereas in an American sample, a wider variety of beliefs as those previously discussed were having a relationship with the hoarding symptoms. And thirdly, emotional attachment to the possession. So compared to healthy controls, individuals with hoarding disorder 
have an increased emotional attachment to the items. They believe that the items are an extension of their identity and just thinking about discarding the items can give them feelings of grief and loss. So how does current treatment target these three things? So firstly, motivational interviewing is used to increase the motivation of the individual to want to undergo treatment. So this means understanding that there is a problem that negatively affects their lives and wanting to change it for themselves rather than being told or feeling with that someone else's responsibility. And this means that the individual is more likely to go through the treatment and find it more effective as they can see that there is a benefit to going through it and how it might actually change their lives for the better. So CBT therefore would focus on challenging these maladaptive beliefs and providing some sort of exposure therapy where they're exposed to their items to see how they would discard them on a moderate scale. Of course, challenging maladaptive beliefs is a big part of CBT in lots of different types of treatments, whether that's for depression and anxiety. And there are different formats that are being undertaken, whether that's individual CBT or group CBT, depending on the clinic or individual or where you are situated. So now let's think of difficulties as described earlier that are not addressed by the CBT model. Firstly, emotional regulation. Firstly, they didn't describe it explicitly as a vulnerability factor that could affect the severity of symptoms. This heightened emotional reactivity may be generalized to other situations not involved in this hoarding environment. Cross-sectional studies have consistently seen a relationship between anxiety, severity, intolerance of uncertainty and distress intolerance, and greater hoarding severity. Also, interpersonal attachment style. Attachment theory suggests that when caregivers are unavailable or inconsistent in their response to the emotional needs of their child, this can develop into dysfunctional patterns of responding that a child may then bring on to adulthood. This could be an anxious attachment style with heightened emotional reactivity and hypervigilance or avoidance attachment style, such as inhibition and emotional blunting which would be seen as having a decreased arousal of emotional reactions. A growing body of research into hoarding disorder has found that it's associated with an insecure interpersonal attachment style. Therefore, anxious attachment is associated with difficulty to discard items, as well as lower perceived social support and a greater attachment to items, as well as distress intolerance and a tendency to assign human-like characteristics onto the items. Therefore, interpersonal function and the lack of relationships with other people could have an effect on hoarding symptoms as you're more likely to attach onto objects around you. One study found a link between greater distress in social situations with a greater attachment to non-living items. Therefore, suggestions for improving treatment items would be to integrate emotional regulation as well as interpersonal skills to make sure that they build on their social relationships around them in order to have further social support and to reduce their reliance on items that may have around them. One study in 2019 administered a version of CBT that also provided psychoeducation about emotional dysregulation and distress tolerance, aiming to help tolerate and identify emotions when acquiring and discarding possessions. Post-treatment, the treatment group had a reduced severity of hoarding symptoms compared to the treatment as usual group who were awaiting less control. However, they did not report the outcomes relating to emotional regulation. Another way we can improve treatment is by acquiring and discarding exposures. Currently, the exposure in which an individual has to gain and discard an item focuses specifically on habituation to the distress, therefore teaching them that the distress will naturally decrease without acquiring and saving possessions. Modern learning theory posits that exposure therapy works by violating fear expectations. However, each exposure activity should violate the expected fear association as much as possible. So for example, describing in detail what they fear, which also includes the cost of the outcome. Clients may find it difficult to articulate their predictions fully due to years of avoidance. And therefore, this would help them see what the actual outcome might more rather be. It can also help them understand that if that outcome does occur, it might not be as bad as they expected. Anyway, I hope this gave you a bit of an understanding into what hoarding disorder is, how it might relate to other comorbid disorders, what treatments are available, and specifically how this may link onto cognitive behaviour theory and how treatments could be improved. 
If you have any questions about what I spoke about or any ideas of future videos, whether that's for my science videos or PhD videos, then please comment below. And if you like this video, then please like and subscribe. Have a good day.